Malware analysis is fun. Well, I think so anyways. If you wanna become the best cybersecurity professional that you can be, then you're going to need to know what malware is. But most importantly, you need to know how to safely analyze it. So that's what we're doing in this video. We're gonna go over how to safely analyze potential malware to determine whether or not something that you found on your computer is benign, or if it's some shady Russian virus in disguise. And if there's one thing I know, it's shady Russians. All right, let's get started. What is malware? The word itself is derived from the word malicious and software. Malware. Us IT people sure are creative, huh? Any software that has a malicious purpose can be considered malware. That app that you downloaded that tracks all your behavior? Probably malware, and you need to get rid of it like now. So how do we investigate these sus apps? Well, there's two primary methods. There's the static and passive way, or my favorite, the dynamic active way. Warning, the malware in this video has been handled by trained professionals. For your safety and protection of those around you, never handle PMS without ADULT. Some things to keep in mind when you do malware analysis is that you make sure that you're doing the analysis on a computer or virtual machine that sole purpose is to do malware analysis with closed or monitored network connections. The last thing that you wanna do is unleash a worm on your home network or worse, your company network. That would be an awkward phone call to your boss. Oh, hey boss, uh, remember that Stuxnet? Thing. The static passive method. This involves analyzing the malware without executing it. Checking for strings in the code, checking for the PE header, or for the more advanced analysts, you can run the code through a disassembler. We're gonna use our favorite handy dandy try hack me platform to analyze some juicy WannaCry malware. So if you've got an account, then follow along, or if you wanna risk it all, download the virtual machine called Remnex VM onto your computer. It's a reverse engineering malware Linux virtual machine. And with that, you want to get a fresh copy of your preferred flavor of malware. Yes, I'll take the ransomware special. Superb choice, sir. How would you like it, sir? Let's go with the fish. And can you add some self-propagating worm to it? Mm, superb choice. Yes. All right, so once you've got your VM, we're going to want to look at what the actual type of file it is. Because malware is often hiding its true identity. It doesn't want you to know that it's not really a Word document with important business notes. Notes, but instead it's actually an executable that's gonna steal all your stuff. So to figure out the file type, we're gonna use the Linux command file. Bet you didn't know you're gonna learn Linux today, huh? As you can see, the file type is a PE32 executable file. It's not a Word document. Aha, we caught ya. Oh man. Next, we'll wanna use the strings command to see if there's any sus strings in the file. And lo and behold, Windows API calls. Windows one true weakness is in fact itself. Oftentimes the output of the strings command is gonna to be too large for the display, in which case you'll wanna send the output into a file like this. Strings, file name, arrow, name of your file. Or you can use the more or less command to parse the output better, and you can use the space bar to scroll through it. You're now Linux certified, congratulations. <laughs> Just kidding. Now I wanna see what the reputation is of this file by getting its file hash. So you can use any of these Linux commands to get the file hash, md5sum, sha1sum, and of course, sha256sum. Then you're gonna wanna put that file hash into VirusTotal, and boom, it lights up like a Christmas tree. Now, file hashes are a great way of statically determining the maliciousness of a file, because even if one bit gets changed in the file, that completely changes the file hash. This is like a double-edged sword, though, where you can use the file hash to determine whether a file is malicious or not, but a bad actor can also just change a bit in their new version of the malware and the malware won't be searchable in these reputation platforms. The platform itself can also give you a ton of information in the various tabs on useful indicators of compromise that are related to the file hash. And then you can use that to investigate. Now let's get a little more sophisticated and check out the PE header of the file. The PE file header contains the metadata about a portable executable file. And there's loads of useful information inside of it that can give you some insight into the nature of the executable. Now this PE header is gonna vary by the compiler that was used to generate the file. But typically you'll see sections that include the CPU commands that the executable does, as well as showing functions that the file calls using the Windows API. If you see a function like internet open or URL download to file function called in the header, then it might be time to consider network quarantining the computer if you haven't already done that by now. Now using the PE check command, we can pull the header of the WannaCry malware, and then you can go over the sections and do a deeper dive into the malware. Are you bored of static analysis yet? Time to make things interesting. Let's run it. Dynamic active analysis. Otherwise known as the quick and dirty way of analyzing malware, this is to simply run it and see what it does. But wait, you're gonna need a sandbox to throw that malware in. 
Now there are a lot of options online that you can just download and install. Some options are Cuckoo's Sandbox or Cape Sandbox. But if you don't want to install them on your computer, which is far more complicated and far more risky, you're in luck because they have online versions as well. My personal favorites are AnyRun and the CrowdStrike built-in sandbox that I use pretty much daily. Now unless you know what you're doing, then uploading malware, even on an online sandbox, can go wrong. So proceed with caution when you're uploading these files. However, in a lot of cases, you can just search for the hash of the file to see if the exact file has already been ran on the sandbox and already been uploaded and analyzed. So if we take a look at the WannaCry analysis that had already been done, we will see the processes that were ran during execution. And if you're paying attention, you're gonna notice this glorious command line here, deleting literally every backup and volume shadow copies. Now, as you can imagine, you can't restore a system back to its untainted glory if there's no backups. You can also see what network connections were made during execution, as well as any files that might have been created. This gives you really good insight on what would happen if this actually had ran on someone's computer. Now in a perfect world, you can do static analysis with no problems whatsoever. But this isn't a perfect world. This is Earth, and hackers don't like it when you try to stop them from stealing your stuff. So they obfuscate and package the code to make it harder for you to do any analysis on it. To make it harder to statically check for strings or even pulling the PE header from the file. If we try to run the strings command on this file, you'll see it's nothing but random characters. That's no help at all. And if we run the PE header of the file, it even tells us the file is most likely packed. So what do we do? Just throw it in the sandbox. We can't do that either. Unfortunately, hackers are getting wise to us and are sandbox proofing their malware. Sprinkle in some long sleep calls, some user and VM detection, and you've got yourself a Gen Z malware. Ah! able to sleep for as long as they want and ghost everyone around them. Hackers know that sandboxes often have a set time that they run before they time out, so the executables can just be delayed for a certain amount of time. Malware can even wait for users to click something or start typing before they execute. They can check for files to exist in certain places like browser history, places where something would exist if it was a normal computer and not a sandbox. And they can even check for files and drivers that are named after commonly used virtual machine brands like VMware or VirtualBox. So for these Gen Z hackers, we have to bust out the advanced analysis tactics. But that's a topic for another time. If you'd like to see that video though, please subscribe and also let me know in the comments if that's something you wanna see. I'm always learning and I'm always watching in the shadows. That's it for basic malware analysis. I hope it was helpful for some of you just starting out in the cybersecurity field. Thank you so much for watching everyone. We'll see you in the next video. How did Stuxnet actually become introduced into the Iranian computers? Okay, so the, the best theory that we have, and certainly it's only theory, but it's backed by, some, by, by good evidence, is that the, uh, the initial infection might have been by a USB thumb drives.